Robots and Avatars um, is a project that's um, emerged from um, a lot of work that Body Data Space and our previous company, Shinkansen's done across the years, and some of you will recognise where we're coming from, as we're very much based at the body at the centre of digital interaction. And it's a project which has been specifically designed to look much more clearly at how young people will work and play with new representational forms of themselves and others in virtual and physical life in the next 10 to 15 years. And the key issues that we're dealing with are multi-identity, behaviours and ethics, which is what today is about, collective collaboration, the future workspace and future careers. What are the future jobs out there? How will young people be working in the future? And what skills do they need to start to be developed now to help them be ready for those jobs? One particular area we're looking at is identity, future identity, and particularly about multi-self, something that maybe our generations are not so used to, the thought of actually there's, there's more than one you that's out there. Today we're going to focus on behaviours and ethics, and this topic came out very much from the young people at the forum we did here in November. How do we behave? What are the ethics within virtual space? Yes, the child starting secondary school today is going to be the workforce for the next 60 odd years um, by, the, by the time they leave. So the world is going to look very different and some of the stuff which may feel slightly blue skies at this stage is actually very, as uh, preaching to but I mean, as you know, a lot of the stuff is actually just around, just around, just around the corner. So we're exploring this in a number of different areas. Technology is obviously one of those areas which is moving incredibly fast and it has an incredibly wide-ranging impact over young people's futures. And that's why we're holding a series of four seminars, roundtables, call it what you will, uh, to the side of the summer, to the other side of the summer, to, to pick up on some key things. I was one of the last generations that grew up with computers that you could program straight out of the box. I had a BBC Micro when I was uh, 10. You could turn it on and immediately program it. Uh, and that experience is not available to kids today, as far as I can see. Um, computers and things that you use, you don't get to program them at all. And I mean, so you look at the stuff that's going on with, you know, Apple's latest line of kids, the arguments all around who gets to who gets to write stuff on them, uh, or are they just portals for consumption? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I think I think that's the most important thing uh, I would put forward is, is the idea that all these virtual worlds uh, are created by people, and they're created by people just like yourself. That it's not it's not some mysterious skill held by a group of people that you don't have access to. I saw a programme the other day, I think it was James Lovelock or something, and he was talking about how when he was a kid he got given a box of wires and light bulbs and circuit boards and stuff and how it had been you know, the best present he'd ever had because it had taught him you know, how things work and the fundamentals and how to put those together. But yeah, as you say, that doesn't seem to be um, part of the way that current technology and games are created at the moment. I agree with you, Ash. Um, but I want to put a caveat to what you say because, yes, everyone can do it, but there is still a severe economic divide. Um, if we look at something like Second Life, it's free to use. It's cross-platform. Oh, that's great. But wait a minute. To really exist, to build a home, to, to have a sim, to have space, to be able to build and express yourself, you have to have quite a bit of money. Where our identities are located and what the virtual, the virtual spaces and their potentials have to offer us in terms of those sorts of issues, you know, not not just in terms of um, what we're able to do with others, but how we how we shift our ethical awareness to a collective level. I think it's really interesting. There's an issue for me here about collective wisdom, actually. So, what are the opportunities that technology? force yeah, us absolutely. to develop wise action, which understands its impact on the on the future. And you talked about technology actually being you know, low, low carbon and things, you know, so to have a real contribution mm. there. Mm. But I think actually there's a kind of there's a leap beyond that mm. that that we could make um, collectively in ways we perhaps can't quite touch yet, which would be enabled by technology. So I'd just be really interested in. If that has any resonance, that idea has any resonance yeah. among others around the table, I'd just be really interested in people's perspectives on it. What does it mean if, if effectively the people are willingly disposing of a degree of classical consciousness, um, or 
you know, and I, I've, you know, I've got a seven and a nine year old daughter, and, and they're actually really not at all interested in doing anything else but using. Um, so I'd, I'd like some tips. Um, but uh, but in terms of their their willingness, in a way, to uh, depart from the notion of privacy and become more porous and exist in new liminal spaces, then starts to beg a whole set of questions for me around. And this this is where it, this this is going out there a bit um, of uh, the acknowledgement of um, the fact that as as a post-human society we're acknowledging in that process um, obsolescence that, that you know do we want to attach ourselves to a romantic sense of some or some segment of classical belief systems or are we actually accepting and knowingly and willingly and wanting to go down a route where effectively we're becoming much more mechanistic um, we, we have uh, left the part of the consciousness over here because it's no longer important but we are working in a hive society because that's what it will take when the population level hits this level. Um, and with it comes, of course, the acceptance that uh, mechanized society, artificial life, is upon us. I think it would also be interesting to have a psychologist in the room because, we're, again, we're talking about the mechanics of how this will all work, but psychologically, um, people interacting with these environments are going to have a whole different set of principles uh, to engage with and they're going to need a completely different belief system, emotional support system, the issue of privacy. Um, the, the virtual child, if there is this cloud mind, can you imagine if you walked into a room with a group of avatars that recognise you instantly but you've never met them before, that, you know, that would put you on your back foot. But in the future, that's what people are going to you know, engage with that straight away. If we think about remaining alive, that's, that for me is not the question. The question is, how can we actually die if we want to? Mm -hmm. You know, we're in the society now where we feed everything to Google. I'm not worried about Microsoft, I'm worried about Google. <laughs> they own everything now. All the data, all the information. Facebook, good example. What if you want to remove yourself from it? What if sort of I work in Second Life, the terms and conditions are actually quite draconian? Everything I produce as an artist, as a researcher, is on some low level owned by Linden Labs. What happens when they go under, sell things off, decide to move on? In some ways, only physically, and it's in the, the computer domain. And in some ways, we, you know, you don't die in some ways. Anyway. I mean, we're moving into the kind of the spiritual realm here, but you know, there's, you leave a bit of yourself with every discussion you've had, every paper you've written, every idea that you've imparted on somebody take, else. Take and so in some ways it's mm -hmm. just being scared of that in a different context. Um, think about the number of people that, yes, I did tick the little box for the terms and conditions for Linden Labs. I did it knowingly, mm -hmm. okay? But for most people that use it, it's in the long list of things that no one ever reads. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not up front. They're not, they're not in that sense honest about it. Yeah, um, and that's a problem. And simply coming back to this, this idea of the multi-self, you know, what happens if that self isn't always you? Well, I'm going to learn that the self that I see isn't necessarily always you. Because just as I know not to always trust Wikipedia, just as I know not to believe mm -hmm. everything I read in the newspapers, people get used to the idea that you know when there's all this information accessible to you, you can't trust all of it, and so they get used to that. I think the creative industry basically you're adding on infinite more ways to be creative, which um, The, the people that are currently in the creative industries have got more ways to be creative and actually it's probably people who are currently not within the creative industry have got greater access points to, to come into that. Um, so I think in terms of the workplace then I think that's, you know, I think that will become uh, a greater workplace for more people and the people that are currently in it will have more opportunities. Um, maybe it would be good to concentrate on that a bit Ben, yeah, more back into the skills mm -hmm. side and the, um, what people feel about curriculum needs, having had this discussion today. Um, well, it is, it is definitely an issue, and so far as I think back to some of the things that I said and that you picked up on, and, you know, the experiences we've had with Club Penguin and things like that with our children, that we've been able to start to educate them through dialogue. You know, you know like my school son, you left us saying, you know, the, you, we discourage the use of Facebook and it's supposed to be over 13 to use it. And I went to, I went to my daughter's school play yesterday, 
Yeah. And it was it, it wasn't tea towels on heads, but it was Wizard of Oz production. Mm-hmm. And that, there's just there's just so much nostalgia in society as well, isn't there? Mm-hmm. That that's the job. Yeah. So that it, you know that we might we might be close to getting it either because of our immediate social relations or because of our expertise in the, in the room. Uh, but in terms of convincing teachers or headmistresses mm-hmm. you know, that, that this is an, an enabling thing or that at least we need to be able to break open a traditional discussion around humanities. Yeah. Um, I think that's where it gets really important to, to probably something we discussed at lunch, is, is to get more schools sort of getting pupils to co-produce the learning experience, co-design and co-produce the learning experience, mm-hmm. which means the problem at the moment is we've got schools <coughs> which change at an institutional or equalational rate over time. Yeah. And the technology which is moving incredibly fast. Mm-hmm. The only way you can really sort of change that dynamic is actually to get give a bigger role to students and young people mm-hmm. in shaping the nature of their learning, assisted, obviously mm-hmm. scaffolding and all the rest of it. So that actually they can keep the pace of change much closer to, to, to the technological developments. I think the only way to deal with the sort of the maybe the kids know how to disable the security features thing is, is actually to think about much more sort of like peer teaching or close peer teaching, maybe by people a few years up, um, and mentoring like that so that it becomes sort of more youth to youth Yes, than. yes. Um, what I think is a is a very interesting area that that, that may may be a way forward is, is student engagement. Student engagement will continue to be an issue for governments of any complexion and uh, student voice and participation I think will continue to be of some interest in terms of students, bringing students on board in terms of mini making it in schools and, and schools feeling like they're relevant places to be. It seems to me that there are some opportunities there for looking at really good dialogue, really good creative dialogue around what it means to engage in any area of the curriculum and opportunities to bring technology into that. But it's going to have to come through a Trojan horse, which might be quite a narrow one. I do think that's a very, very interesting place to be, given where technology is, given where some of the possibilities and thinking are, given where actually the wider population is in terms of what it's doing uh, at whatever age. I actually think there's a real role for the kind of work that Robots and Avatars is doing kinds of work that Nesta can do to really fuel that debate. Because actually teaching in its narrower sense in the college which is hardly creative. The industry is suffering from a from from a massive um, skill shortage. It, it's desperate to to recruit more people than it's been able to because what it needs are people with physics degrees, people with computer science degrees, people with maths degrees. And of course those are exactly the degrees that nobody is doing anymore. Just uh, something exciting is that, and there's an entire new industry blossoming of virtual actors. So in these kinds of exercise exercises, sometimes you need some extras, whether it's sales demos or actually. So we know some people that have formed a business, and their entire job is, is acting virtually. And one of the guys is uh, is under 18, and he's 17 now, and participates in a wide range of uh, activities. And so he's been a bank manager, he's been a bank teller. He's been uh, doing new higher orientation sales. He's played all these roles. I just think from an educational perspective, what, um, uh, how interesting that he's worked with people around the world without leaving his house already. Can I just yeah. say one thing yeah. I just thought um, was really important before when you were talking about not being able to code on computers anymore. I mean, I think my first computer exam was Drive 464, which had the tape deck. <laughs> next to the side, it took about three quarters of an hour for any games load, that kind of I thing. I said excited <laughs> <laughs> um, But I think there's still going to be the context that coding is for some people and not for others. Mm. And the thing that's um, really good about the Little Big Planet is that you can, you know, kind of novices can create these environments. Mm. I don't know if anybody's seen the Lego approach to programming, which I've seen at an educational, was it BET? Which yes. I was just, yeah. I thought that was amazing, yeah. that actually the bringing this block-based programming knowledge to young people was really, really, like, just really encouraging and actually people don't have to be programmers to be able to have control over potentially what these environments are going to be. Well look, thanks very much everybody and thanks Stephen and Ron and Michael for preparing as well for and sharing um, your observations and, and then everybody for inputting.